10 Challenges for the Repent of Sins for Salvation Morons I have done a lot of study material on repentance at this stage. I have explained this topic ad nauseum, and to this day I still get the same boring repetitive talking points over and over again by these parrots repeating the same old boring fallacies and idiotic talking points. They're very sure of themselves that they're right and I'm wrong, but they are very predictable and repetitive. So to mix things up a bit, this video won't actually be addressed to my typical audience of favourable subscribers, but rather this video is aimed at the enemies of the gospel. 10 challenges to the morons who say that you have to repent of sins to be saved. Challenge number one. Learn how to read! In my first documentary, I provided scores of scriptures showing you on the screen where the Bible says repent and doesn't say of your sins. And it's amazing how many idiots posted verses in the comments about repentance to refute the documentary, as if they think that I or my viewers don't know or don't care that these verses exist. Just to further demonstrate how willfully blind these morons are, I pinned a comment in that documentary saying, yes, I can see where Jesus said repent. We all know this. Nobody is surprised by this. Nobody is denying this. And the very first person who replied to that comment quoted a verse that uses the word repent and then called me a complete liar as if he thinks I deny the existence of this verse or that I don't know the Bible says repent. Why did he read my comment and then rebuke me as if I deny that repentance is a biblical concept when the comment he is replying to quite literally acknowledges it? This is one of the many examples of these idiots I have to contend with on a regular basis who don't actually read or listen before they post their nauseating foolish commentary. And if you're one of these people, why is it that I can literally show you a verse on the screen, like Acts 2.38, for example, proving with visual aids that it doesn't say, repent of your sins. And even when looking at it on the screen, you still say, it says, repent of your sins, when there is no of your sins in this verse. Are you really so intellectually retarded that you can't read what it does and doesn't say? And yes, the comments shown on this screen belongs to the video on this screen. That's the magnitude of foolishness that we're dealing with here. In fact, I can provide you with an entire list of verse after verse after verse that says, repent without saying of your sins. But you idiots will probably even quote these verses on a comment against this video as some sort of proof text that the Bible says, repent of your sins. Over and over again, you will find the prophets of the Bible saying, it is written, it is written, as it is written. If it's important to know what is written, then it's probably important that you know how to read what is written. You should be able to read a basic sentence and understand what the author did and did not say. It's incredible how most of you don't get confused by simple mathematics, such as 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's amazing how most of you don't get confused by basic rules of grammar, such as subject-verb agreement. It's fascinating how most of you can read a cake recipe and not get confused by those instructions. You don't read magical, mystical ingredients that aren't in the list. You probably don't get confused about the differences between self-raising flour and plain flour, or caster sugar and demerara sugar. Yet somehow, for some very strange reason, you can read a verse like Acts 19.4, which doesn't say repentance from sins, and it literally explains to you in plain English that John the Baptist's message of repentance was about believing on the Christ, not changing your lifestyle or turning from your sins. Yet you still think that this is clearly teaching repent of your sins. Your complete inability to understand a concept that the Bible plainly explains to you single-handedly proves that you are the ones with a false understanding of repentance, not me. So please, open your eyes, buy a pair of spectacles or contact lenses, and learn to be able to read the difference between repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and repent of your sins for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's not that complicated, but you do have to learn how to read. Of course you will argue against this and go to the ends of the earth to justify yourself, saying that oh, repent means turn from sins because I said so. Well, if you are so sure that the word repent on its own substantiates that the preaching was about turning from sins because sinful behaviour was keeping them from heaven, then logically you should be able to show me from these passages where Jesus or the apostles point out the endless list of sinful wicked deeds of their audience as the context of the message of repentance and the focal aspect of their dialogue. 
You should be able to show me in the preceding verses where the perpetually sinful lifestyles of the audience was discussed. You should be able to show me where the preachers reference the law of Moses, explaining how evil sin is and how they need to start obeying these commandments in order to obtain eternal life. You should be able to show me the follow-up sessions, where the speaker had a fruit inspection of the audience. So that leads me on to challenge number two. Show me where a lifestyle of sinful behaviour in reference to moral law is the context of all of these gospel preaching moments where repent was commanded. For example, many of you will say to me that repentance was the very first thing that Jesus preached when he started his ministry, citing Mark chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 4. Well, okay then, open up Mark chapter 1 and find the verses where Jesus preached repentance. Show me in those two verses where Jesus rebuked the sinful lifestyles of the audience before telling them to repent. Go on, you've got two whole verses full of dialogue. Find it, show me something. Show me where he rebukes adultery or fornication or murder or idolatry or witchcraft in these verses. If that's what he is telling his audience to repent of. After all, you say that repent as a standalone word means turn from sin. Some of you say that this is how the Jews would have understood it. So show Jesus ripping on the Jews for their sinful behaviour here. When you realise that you can't do this from Mark chapter 1, open Matthew chapter 4, where you have more verses to play with, and try again. Show me Jesus rebuking evil wicked sinners in these verses. After all, Jesus quotes scripture from the Old Testament in this excerpt. So show me where he quoted scripture that says, Turn from transgression, or turn from iniquity. For example, show Jesus quoting Isaiah 59.20 before he says repent, or show him quoting Ezekiel 18.30 or Jeremiah 36.3 before he says repent. I can see in my King James Bible that he quoted passages about himself, not about you, but maybe your Bible has some extra verses that mine is missing. So show me something. Of course, when you realise that you can't answer this, you will do your usual thing of running off like a coward to a completely different passage and just pretending that the previous conversation never happened. So you will point out something else that Jesus said, like, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Okay then, so the same challenge applies. Go to the passage where Jesus said, repent, or you shall all likewise perish. Show me where Jesus pointed out the sins of the audience members and rebuked them. There are five verses that form the record of this conversation. I'm showing you them on the screen. So show me. What sins did this audience need to repent of? Were they drunkards? Were they fornicators? Were they idolaters? I'm literally showing you the verses on the screen that set the context of the conversation. Show me Jesus pointing out these fleshly sins to this audience. I dare you. Of course, you will just do the same thing again and run off to a completely different passage without answering me like most of you always do. And we can play this game with multiple places in the Bible where you try to play this game of scriptural cat and mouse. When I point out to you that when Jesus came to call sinners to repentance, he was the one doing the action in this verse, not the sinner, and Jesus did not directly address any of Levi's sins. So what do you do? You run off to another passage, like the joy over one sinner that repents. And then when I refute your ridiculous quote mining on that passage, you will run off to another passage. And so on, and so on. Why do you do this? Why do you quote random verses about repentance, or random verses that in many cases have nothing to do with repentance? Then as soon as I address your false beliefs about that passage, you don't answer me, but you just run off to another randomly quote mined passage. Why can't most of you go back to that passage you yourself quoted and address what I just said? Sometimes, though, on the odd occasion, some of you think that you will have come up with something. For example, you will point out that In Acts chapter 2, Peter accused them of crucifying Jesus. Crucifying Jesus is a sin, therefore you have to repent of your sins. But once again, if you actually met the first challenge and learned how to read, and maybe even bothered to employ your brain for five seconds, you would know that killing the Christ was a one-time sin. It wasn't a lifestyle of perpetual sinning over and over again. Peter was preaching about Jesus, not about their lifestyle. He was emphasising the person they did it to, not the act of murder itself. You morons seem to think that you are somehow emulating Peter in Acts chapter 2 by screaming at random people in the streets and listing these long lists of perpetual fleshly sins that they need to repent of. But why don't we see Peter doing this in Acts chapter 2 and 3? Why didn't Peter rebuke this audience for drunkenness and fornication and whoremongery and sodomy and left-wing politics and false religion and lying and theft in Acts chapter 2 and 3? You filthy false prophets say that that's what it's about, so show me in these two chapters where Peter addresses these subjects. Go on, I dare you. Even when a particular sin is discussed in a passage about repentance, you always emphasise it as being about disobedience to the law. But the apostles themselves didn't do this. Why is that? 
For example, you will point to the Mars Hill dialogue in Acts 17, saying that they needed to repent of idolatry, and idolatry is a sin, which is of course transgression of the law. Therefore, they need to repent of their sins, aka repent of transgressing the law. But Paul didn't address the moral law in this dialogue. He emphasised the Christ, who they were supposed to repent towards, just as Peter did in Acts 2 and 3. And in fact, it was their ignorance that they needed to repent of, which you would know if you learned how to read as per the first challenge. Why do you always try to take the glory away from Jesus and put it on yourself in your own obedience? Why do you always emphasise the law and obedience to that law, for which the Bible plainly states that nobody is justified unto righteousness, instead of emphasising Christ who washes, justifies and sanctifies? But I understand questions like this are probably too difficult for you when the cognitive dissonance kicks in. It's much easier for you to just play scriptural cat and mouse and run off to some other randomly quote mind verses, so let's just move on to the next challenge. Challenge number three. Stop running to random passages that have nothing to do with repentance to define what repentance is. For example, the amount of times you morons will repeat this over and over again. Jesus said sin no more. Sounds like repentance to me. This statement does not use the verb repent. It does not define what repentance is. So if you're just going to quote my random verses and say this is what repent means, you could just make up any definition of words that you wanted, which is of course what most of you do anyway. For example, we could just quote mine John chapter 9 and say, Jesus said go wash in the pool of Siloam. Repent, metanoia, change your mind, go wash in the pool. Or we could say, Jesus said let us go up to Jerusalem. Repent, metanoia, change your sinful ways and book your flight to Jerusalem. Repent. Jesus said all kinds of things. You can't just quote mine random statements that Jesus made that don't mention repentance and then use them to define what repentance means and apply that to John's preaching or Peter's preaching on the subject. It's nonsense. What you are essentially doing here is begging the question. You've already decided that repent means sin no more, so you think that just quoting a verse that says sin no more is somehow proof of what repent means. That's not how proving things works. So you are either intellectually challenged and not mentally fit to be lecturing anybody about this subject, or you are just incredibly confused and should just stop talking, or you're a filthy, wicked child of Satan who just makes stuff up. But seeing as we are on this topic of go and sin no more, that leads me on to the next challenge. Challenge number four. Learn the difference between eternal life and non-eternal life verses. For example, we know that John 3.16 is a verse about eternal life because it literally says everlasting life. We can see then that the instruction here is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, which is biblical repentance pertaining to eternal life. Notice that it doesn't say anything about turning from sin, and for the record, neither does the surrounding context of this verse. When you quote minor statement like sin no more, and you say that's what repentance for salvation means, well, there's no evidence that this statement has anything to do with eternal life. When Jesus said sin no more to the woman caught in adultery, or the man who was healed at the pool of Bethesda, he didn't talk about eternal life to either of those two people. You will of course infer eternal life from the surrounding statements like neither do I condemn thee, or lest the worst thing come upon me, because you're false prophets who just make stuff up. The surrounding context gives no indication that eternal hellfire was the context of either of those statements. Eternal life was not discussed with either recipient. Same thing again when you quote Revelation 2.5. Besides the fact that it doesn't say, repent of your sins, there is no mention of eternal life in that passage either. Of course, you will just say something like, you can't just cherry pick eternal life passages where we have to consider the whole of Jesus' teaching. Well, here's the problem with that. You arbitrarily pick and choose which of Jesus' statements you apply to repentance or not. For example, I already gave you the aforementioned example of go wash in the pool of Siloam. Well, why isn't that an eternal life commandment for true biblical repentance? Or the other aforementioned example, when he said, let us go up to Jerusalem. Why do you conveniently ignore his commandment here for eternal life if we have to consider the whole of Jesus' teaching for true biblical repentance? What about when Jesus said, offer your gift at the altar? I don't see you flying down to Jerusalem to give your gift at the altar. Why isn't this an eternal life commandment for true biblical repentance? The fact that you will even admit that all of those verses have nothing to do with repentance onto eternal life means that you can't just take every single thing that Jesus ever said and apply it to eternal salvation. Of course, those verses have nothing to do with eternal life because Jesus isn't talking about eternal life in those verses. And he isn't talking about repentance in those statements either. Well, guess what? When he said, go and sin no more, he's not talking about eternal life and he's not talking about repentance onto salvation. 
So learn the difference and start with the conversations where Jesus actually mentioned eternal life instead of just quote mining random verses to make your own filthy points like your father Satan did when he tried to tempt Jesus in the wilderness. Challenge number five. Repent of your own sins first and obey the commandment to avoid foolish questions. It's very convenient how you filthy sinful hypocrites cherry pick all of these commandments that you like and you don't like. You love to sit on your backside typing away telling everybody else to repent of their sins when you're filthy wicked sinners yourself who disobey the teachings that you don't like. One of those commandments that you don't like and sin against constantly without repenting, ironically, is the commandment that says avoid foolish questions. Take a look at this commentator. This is the same moron who says Acts 2.38 quite clearly says repent of your sins on a video where I show him on the screen that it doesn't. So we're obviously dealing with someone who's either intellectually retarded or given over to Satan. Take your pick. He's the sort of person that bombards free grace channels with comments about how true repentance leads us to righteousness and doing works out of love and blah blah blah, even though he doesn't actually participate in this himself. He doesn't do any video content on his own channel to promote the gospel or teach the nations. He just sits there typing comments on the same people's YouTube channels all day, thinking that that counts as evangelism for some reason. So he asks this stupid question. Where in scripture does it say don't repent of your sins? Well, what kind of moronic question is that? Because we could apply that to anything. Where in scripture does it say, don't eat potatoes to be saved? Or don't go up to the altar to be saved? Or don't confess your sins to the priest to be saved? The Bible doesn't give you an unnecessarily long list of everything not to do to be saved. It tells you the one thing that you have to do to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So what kind of a stupid question is that? He then asks another foolish question immediately afterwards. Where did Jesus say believe in me for the forgiveness of sins? This is one of those trick questions intended to willfully deceive people into thinking that, well, because Jesus never personally said it, it's therefore not true. This is a bit like when those Hebrew roots Judaizer freaks and weirdos say that, well, Jesus never mentioned the word grace, so therefore, you know, it's not salvation by grace. The reason why we can't find Jesus saying believe for the forgiveness of sins is because it wasn't Jesus who said it, you idiot. It was Peter who said it in Acts 10 43. Peter said in this verse, whosoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins. So what kind of retarded question is it to ask where Jesus ever said this? Is it no longer valid because Peter said it instead of Jesus? All you are proving by asking these retarded questions is that you're filthy wicked sinners yourself by asking foolish questions when the Bible explicitly commanded you to avoid foolish questions and the Bible says that even the thought of foolishness is sin. You say that we have to repent of our sins to be saved, yet you yourselves are knowingly and willingly disobeying this commandment. I guess you filthy hypocrites just love your sin more than you love God. Challenge number six. Either learn actual Greek and Hebrew or stop pretending that you know the language. When you morons lose the argument in English, you then have to run off to a language that most of us don't speak so as to manipulate people into thinking that Greek and Hebrew are some sort of mystical, magical language that can express all of these emotionally overwhelming ideas in one word that simply can't be expressed in English. Even though we have more words in English than any other language in history by a long shot, nothing is more expressive than the English language. I point out to you that in the Old Testament, which was written in Hebrew, God repented. So you point to the Greek and say that in the Greek New Testament, the word does actually mean turn from sin. Or you say that in the Old Testament, God repenting is a different word altogether, and the Hebrew word teshuva means to turn away from a lifestyle of sin and turn back to God, and that's how the Jews understood it. Well, I'm not sure why you would point to what Christ rejecting Judaism tells us what Christian repentance means, but in any case, go look up teshuva in the concordance. It strongs reference H8666. It is the noun for return or turn, and it is only used eight times in the entire Old Testament, and not one of those times does it refer to turning from sin. Or why don't you also look up the Greek Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and you will see that God metaneoed, the verb for metanoia. Yes, that's right. The same Greek word that tells you to repent in the New Testament is also used in the Greek translation in the Old Testament. In several verses where God repented, according to that Hebrew word, you like to pretend means something completely different. You can also look up Plutarch's Moralia, secular literature from shortly after Christ's time, which uses metanoia for something that has absolutely nothing to do with turning from sin, because it's an ordinary word, not some mystical, magical, transformational concept. I didn't discover these things that I told you. They didn't just descend from heaven and come to me by revelation. These are things that you can find out yourself by googling them for five seconds, but you don't do it.
It is very clear that most of you idiots don't speak Greek or Hebrew. You just make up lies to deceive the simple. You say that we have to turn from all sins, yet you yourselves are liars, and all liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. I guess you just love your sin more than you love God. Challenge number seven. Since you say that belief without preaching repentance of sins is a false gospel, justify the multitudes of times when Jesus or the apostles did not tell their listeners to repent of their sins. And justify it without making stuff up that's not true or just spouting nonsense. When Jesus preached to Nicodemus about eternal life in John chapter 3, he told him, Whosoever believeth in me should not perish but have everlasting life. Nowhere did Jesus bring up Nicodemus' sins or tell him to repent of his sins. He had every opportunity to do so, and yet he didn't for some reason. I guess he just didn't feel like it. In John chapter 4, where we are told that the Samaritans believed on him, we are not told that they got down in sackcloth and ashes and repented of their sins. I don't know why John couldn't stretch his writing onto just a little bit more paper to tell us this. Maybe he just couldn't be bothered. In John chapter 5, and 6, and 7, and 8, and 9, and 10, and 11, and 12... Jesus told people to believe on him without telling them to repent of their sins. Sin no more, in John 5 and 8, was not said to the same audiences who were told to believe, and the audiences of sin no more were not told about eternal life. In Acts 16, Paul and Silas told the prison keeper to believe to be saved without telling him to repent of his sins. There are other examples in the Bible too, but I'm sure you get the point. So justify this. Would it really hurt the writer of these conversations to document Jesus or the apostles saying repent of sins? Did Jesus or Paul really not have the opportunity to just extend their evangelism by one sentence or even half a sentence to tell them to repent of sins? You'd be amazed at the excuses that people bring up for this one. So there's this moron who goes by the channel name Seeking the One Saved. You may have not heard of him because his videos don't usually get many views, and even after having a channel for several years, he hardly has any subscribers. Nobody really pays attention to this guy. Mainly because his content is really, really boring and badly done, quite frankly, even to people who aren't saved. But anyway, I digress. He once did a video about me following some verse he had commented on my first documentary, and I challenged him in the comments to come up with his excuses for this. Here's what he said. So he's saying because... Uh, he caught the Apostle Paul preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus in a moment without saying the word the words repent of sins. That's supposed to prove something. No, that's not the case. Take, for example, if I wear a T-shirt that says Jesus saves, I just preach the gospel. It doesn't have to say you need to repent of your sins. Okay, so no, I wouldn't accuse the Apostle Paul because he said Jesus saves, and he didn't at the same time say uh, all the other details of the gospel and salvation at the same time that we're preaching a different message. I do the same thing. Okay. I tell people Jesus saves and okay. And then I might catch my bus and not see them. All right. So that's, that's nonsensical. I mean, talk about making up an answer on the spot because you don't actually have one. He very conveniently fixated on Paul's instance in Acts 16, where we don't have a lot of dialogue, and ignored many citations that I gave him from John's Gospel. He just failed to mention it in his video for some reason. Rather convenient, but then how else is he going to manipulate the tiny number of people who are stupid enough to listen to him? These accounts in John's Gospel are detailed conversations, spanning several verses in red letters. Jesus had every opportunity to tell them to repent of their sins if it was so important, yet he didn't for some reason. I guess he just didn't feel like it. And even though Acts 16 has very little dialogue, Paul was not running to escape out of the prison as fast as possible. The prison keeper approached him. Paul was not in a hurry to get out of there. But again, this is the stupid stuff you morons say to just come up with excuses because you don't have an answer. And this leads me on to challenge number eight. Stop making up your own definition of words and terms. Let the Bible define them for you. Now, I just explained to you in the previous challenge that John chapter three is a perfectly good example of Jesus telling Nicodemus to believe for everlasting life without telling him to repent of his sins. When I've shown this to people, I often get responses like this. He said be born again. Are you stupid? I can see that he said that, but that's not what I asked you, is it? I am not asking you about being born again. I am asking you about repenting of your sins. You can't just make up your own definition of terms and words. That's not what born again means. If John chapter 3 says, be born again, and it also says, believe on him for everlasting life, but it doesn't say repent of your sins, guess what born again means then? 
That's right, it means believe for everlasting life. Nothing to do with turning from sins, because that's how Jesus expounded on it. Of course, that's not the only part of the Bible where they just pick these random statements and turn them into some sort of repent of sins proof text. Let me show you another example. He said, deny yourself and take up the cross. Well, once again, I can see that, but that's still not what I asked, is it? I'm not asking you to show me where the Bible says deny self and take up the cross. I already know the Bible says this. I am asking you to show me where Jesus told people to repent of sins for everlasting life. Of course, this is the bit where you say, oh, dude, that's what it means, you stupid dummy. <laughs> well, okay then, we can simply apply the same logic to deny self, take up the cross and follow me, as I challenged you to apply to repentance in challenge number two. Show me in the Bible where turning from sins was the context of this statement. I will use Matthew 16 as the account of choice to expound on this. The context starts in verse 21, when Jesus explained that he must go up to Jerusalem to be killed and raised again. No mention of sin so far. In the next verse, Peter rebuked Jesus, insisting that this shall not be done unto thee. Peter was trying to prevent Jesus from going to his death at Jerusalem. He didn't want this to happen. More context, but still no mention of sin so far. Then in the next verse, Jesus rebukes him in return. Now it's a strong rebuke, don't get me wrong. Rebuking Peter and calling him Satan for caring about the things of men rather than God. So yes, you could argue that Peter was being carnally minded, sure. But it had nothing to do with fleshly sins. It just had to do with Peter's misunderstanding the importance of what Jesus must go and do because he loved Jesus and didn't want Jesus to go through his death. That's important context, but still has nothing to do with drunkenness or fornication or stealing or murder or any fleshly sins that Peter was being overcome by. And so we reach the statement, deny self and take up the cross and follow me. It had absolutely nothing to do with these fleshly sins that you love to keep talking about. Because Jesus did not accuse Peter of doing any of these things. Jesus was talking about himself, not about you. Of course, you will just ignore everything I've pointed out and verse hop to the next one where it says that God the Father shall reward every man according to his works. Well, okay then. Regarding sin, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you use a verse about being judged by works as evidence for repenting of sin, you will be found a hypocrite. How do you think God is going to judge you for taking a statement that's not talking about fleshly sins and bear false witness to it by making it about turning from sins? Well, he's going to judge you for being a liar and a false prophet. Liars and false prophets shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. That's your works. That's how you will be rewarded. How do you think God is going to judge you for taking passages that are talking about Jesus and making them all about you? He's going to judge your filthy works of stealing the glory away from the Son of God, abasing you after you exalted yourself above the very Christ. Challenge number nine. Stop taking the glory away from Jesus. Stop taking passages that are talking about Jesus and making them all about you. As I already pointed out to you earlier, Jesus' quotes from the Old Testament in his preaching about repentance were about himself as the coming Christ, not about your penitent attitude. How did we move from talking about Jesus to it being all about you? Also, when John the Baptist quoted verses from the Old Testament in his preaching about repentance, they were about Jesus as the coming Christ, not about your penitent attitude. So how did we move from John talking about Jesus to it being all about you? When Peter preached repentance in Acts chapter 2 and 3, he didn't mention stealing or drunkenness or fornication or covetousness. He did talk extensively about Jesus, though. You will, of course, point to the fact that he accused the audience of killing the Christ, but this was a one-time sin, not a perpetually sinful lifestyle. And Peter never actually referenced the law of Moses to discuss the evils of murder. He was actually talking about the Christ, the one whom they rejected. That's what he was emphasising. So I ask you again, how did we move from Peter talking about Jesus to it being all about you? When Paul preached about repentance in Acts 17, he did not quote the Old Testament law of Moses to explain what an evil, wicked sin idolatry is. Instead, he emphasised the true God, the one who they should be worshipping instead. When he talked about preaching repentance in Acts 26, he was referring back to his preaching in Acts 9 at Damascus and Jerusalem, which, you'll never guess this, was about Jesus, not about you, verse 29. So once again, how did we move from Paul talking about Jesus to it being all about you? You are not the Christ. You are not the Messiah. We don't want to hear about what an awesome self-righteous Christian you are with your fanciful self-absorbed testimony that shows how awesome you are. 
We are only interested in Jesus' testimony. So stop stealing the glory away from Jesus and realise that repentance is pointing us to look towards him and his righteousness, not you going about to establish your own righteousness, which Paul warned about. Challenge number 10. Stop mindlessly quoting verses while making no kind of argument whatsoever. I get comments all the time on my channel where some of you idiots just quote my random verses about repentance as if you think I don't know they exist. But then you don't say anything about them or give any meaningful commentaries to why you are quoting the verse or what relevance it has to anything I just said. Just quoting a verse in a comment with nothing said about that verse isn't an argument for anything. And some of you seem to think that capitalising the word repentance somehow is a point in of itself. Well, okay then, I'll just do the same thing to you. Here's my proof text for my teaching about true biblical repentance. 1 Kings 4.7 And Solomon had 12 officers over all Israel, which provided victuals for the king and his household, each man his month in a year made provision. There you go, false prophets. I dare you to argue against such an irrefutable scripture about what repentance really means. Or here's another one, Judges 8.4 And Gideon came to Jordan and passed over he and the 300 men that were with him faint yet pursuing them. I don't know how you false prophets can say that repentance means turn from sin when I have just provided you with this irrefutable verse from Judges. You're clearly just rejecting this verse in the Bible and you have no refutation for my solid biblical argument here. Well, of course you have nothing to refute what I just said because I didn't say anything, did I? I just quote mind random verses, capitalise some words without making any actual point, which is exactly what a lot of you do when you just quote mind random verses from across the Bible without saying anything, thinking that you're proving somehow that repentance for salvation means turn from sin. When I confront you about this, some of you come up with these various excuses like, I'm not posting it for your benefit, but for the benefit of anybody who may be reading. Well, you're not helping anybody because you preach a false gospel. If you want to benefit them, you're going to need a millstone, some rope, a boat, and you need to be out in the middle of the ocean. In case you haven't noticed, we have a full Bible here, Genesis to Revelation, in a bookbinded format. Or you can just get the app on your mobile phone, which most of us have. We don't need to just scroll through random verses on YouTube and scroll through all of the comments to accidentally come across your comment to try and piece together what the Bible says. We already know the, what the Bible says. It's right here. We don't need your help just mindlessly quoting random verses in a section of YouTube comments. You're just wasting your own time. They don't need your useless quote minds to know what the Bible says. They'll read it right here. It's almost as if I have these like battery operated parrots that I just press a button and random verses come out. Luke 13, 3, what? Matthew 4, 17, what? Mark 1, 15, what? 1 Corinthians 6, what? Acts 2, 38. But it's like this button is stuck and the batteries just won't run out. So have a go. See how many of these challenges you can meet. But I'll probably be ignoring most of you anyway because you have absolutely no grasp of irony whatsoever. You all suffer from the Dunning-Kruger effect. So of course you're not going to meet any of these challenges but you'll strut around like a winner who, as if you demolished all of them because that's the kind of thing that you do. It's just impossible to win an argument against a complete idiot. This is No Nonsense Christianity reminding you that nowhere in the Bible does it say repent of your sins to be saved.